Hi, this is Paul. One of the things I didn't get a chance to speak much about during the conference was something that's sort of been rattling around in my mind. It's along the veins of the enchantment, disenchantment topic. Um, I touched on that a bit with Richard Beck. Uh, spoke with him about some of these issues. This is a this is a constant piece that comes up in the Universal History series. Universal History series is my favorite um, my favorite series on Jonathan's channel. I love it when Richard Rowland come in. Um, I've asked Jonathan to send me Richard Rowland. Richard, if you listen to this, you can just send me an email. I'd love to s just do a, a biographical talk with you, hear your story, and then, of course, you've seen it before probably. First hour is probably going to be mostly biography with you. Second hour, the conversation will go where it will. But th this, this what, part of what develops in the modern period, I think along with sort of a scientific imagination and a scientific framework is a really tight correspondentism with respect to a lot of things. One of the things that comes up in the Exodus seminar that Dennis Prager notes, he says, you know, there are, there are many capital offenses in the Torah, but the only one that we actually sort of see enforced is that for murder. Oh, that's interesting. Now, they do touch on Leviticus 10, which is an important verse where the Lord will take the life of people. But in terms of how that gets administered by the state in the Torah, Dennis Prager's comment I thought was really interesting to me because one of the things that you know if you read the Bible is that there is a certain degree of looseness to it that I think in the modern period... Um, sort of gets wrung out. Now, I haven't I haven't read from this book for a while. It is um, Reformations, the Early Modern World, 1450 to 1650, and this section on superstition. For Catholics, any writer practice unsanctioned by the church that aimed at gaining supernatural favors, I don't really have this window quite set right, Supernatural favors could be deemed superstitious. Protestant churches followed this guideline too, but they added many of the rites of the Catholic Church to their list of superstitions. Two confessions, uh, the two confessions sh shared a narrower understanding of superstition firmly limited by two distinguishing traits, passivity and ignorance. This most simple realm of superstition, more mundane than any others, consisted of all attitudes, behaviors, and devotions that were passively and ignorantly accepted and unquestioningly engaged in. This kind of superstition required no special knowledge or training other than it provided mere exposure to one's culture. But one of the things that you can note in the Jordan Peterson um, Exodus series now to my, the best of my knowledge, they haven't put out a clip from the Exodus series since after episode 15, which has been a little while ago. I hope they keep clipping them. Um, one of the things that emerges, one of the videos I want to do, I'm sort of still on the fence in terms of do I wait and see if Daily Wire is going to release these things to the public or not. If so, it's much nicer commenting on them when the full when the full episodes are out there rather than just taking a little clip and commenting on the little clip. But Jordan very much, you see movement in him through the process of these 32 two-hour um, or 16 two-hour episodes. That's 32 hours plus episode 17, which is an hour, which is sort of a summary, which is in of itself one of the most interesting of the Exodus episodes. But he really takes a turn towards the personal in this, and, and he understands how persons and personality, how this figures into it. C.S. Lewis writes a lot about the relationship between magic and technology, and superstition, I think, would have a lot to do with magic over personhood. And, and of course, part of the meaning crisis is to try to turn personhood into technology into mechanism. Mechanism is sort of this locked tight one-to-one -one differential. Every time you put a certain amount of electricity and water in a certain way, you will always yield a certain amount of hydrogen and a certain amount of oxygen. That's the spirit of geometry. 
And so what we're talking about is the spirit of finesse with respect to persons. And so superstition is, is, is sort of on the magic hierarchy. It's, or it's, on, it's in the magical realm. And, and this seems to be some of the, the difficulties that they're dealing with with respect to superstition. This kind of superstition requires no special knowledge or training other than that it provides mere exposure to one's, um, to one's culture. Among Catholics, the campaign against this kind of mundane superstition had begun in the late Middle Ages, but it was conducted at a learned level by elite reformists rather than at the parish level. So you see this association between... And Now, I'm going to assume that modernity really sort of grows slowly into the church. And when you see big breaks like the Protestant Reformation, that's, that's sort of like an earthquake where pressure, pressure builds, 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 and then bang, you get a slip of the plates. Um, it's sort of a camel's back type of thing, the straw that broke the camel's back. The whole purpose of that image is the straw weighs hardly anything, but then you see this major shift. And, and so what, what Erie is noting is that the pressure is building for a number of centuries. Intellectuals such as Jean Gerson, 1363 to 1429, Chancellor of the University of Paris would de could decry the many superstitions that existed in his day but lacked the means to put an end to them. Gerson expanded the definition of superstition to include certain practices, attitudes, and expectations that had crept into legitimate rites of the Catholic Church. There are many things introduced under the appearance of religion among simple Christians, he said, which it would have been more holy to have omitted. He thus brought the critique of superstition inside the church, so to speak, calling attention to offenses within it. Others, and in particular, um, uh, Guillaume Briconnet, I can't speak French, Erasmus of Rotterdam followed suit, further developing this internal scrutiny along humanistic lines, pushing for ad fontes house clearing, which would bring the church back to its pristine first century shape. Right there, you begin to see the spirit behind the Protestant Reformation already well underway in, in people like Erasmus. And of course, that's no, that's no mystery. Briconet and Erasmus refused to, to condemn the rights of the church outright, but their critique of superstition took a more radical turn among their followers. When contemporaries of Erasmus blamed him for laying the egg hatched by Luther, most of them had in mind the Erasmian <coughs> attack on super superstition within the Catholic Church. From 1517 on, this critique could have taken, could have been, would be taken in two different directions, period, paths. Look at this little typo in the book. Within the Catholic Church, many continued to campaign against superstitious practices and attitudes, but refrained from arguing that any sanctioned rites were superstitious in and of themselves. Within the emerging Protestant camp, the critique turned sharply against Catholic Catholicism itself and all its rituals, which also forced Catholics to engage in a much more vigorous house cleaning than ever before. Now, now, part of what you see, of course, is the Catholics are going to say, well, within our official things, those aren't superstitions, those are, that's the, that's the work of God. Protestants are going to narrow that down. Now, as Protestantism, Protestant, and, and, you, and an example of it might be, well, real miracles are in the Bible. Anything outside the Bible not real. I got a question Friday um, about uh, secessionism in Protestant churches, which is basically a belief that the miracle age had ended. And so, well, miracles only in the Bible, none outside the Bible, none since the Bible. And you sort of see this movement in spirit going on. And, and of course, early on, it's, it's, it's there attempting to address superstition. Now, I think if we if we look at something like sort of opponent processing between spirits, you have a sense of that. You have a sense that, well, superstition is a real thing, that some people are simply gullible and they believe everything. And then you have a sense that a certain spirit takes over, which is a, 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 a sort of a grip lock, cause and effect correspondentism that, that allows nothing. And so then you see sort of opponent processing between the two, try to figure out, okay, well, where, where exactly is the line? What can we believe? And it's, it's going to be all over the spectrum. It might be, I don't know if it'll be a bell curve, but what it'll be like. 
Protestants all agree that the Roman Catholic Church was thoroughly corrupted by superstition from top to bottom, and much of their war on superstition con uh, consisted of their rejection of Catholic piety. Luther re uh, retained much more of medieval folk religion than many other major reformers, especially in regard to all things diabolical. But he, non but he nonetheless rejected much of Catholic ritual as useless works righteousness, especially those rites that gave the impression of guaranteeing there's that spirit of modernity, that cause and effect, that mechanization to turn everything into let's say, a process like the electro electrolysis of water. Here's how much hydro hydrogen, here's how much oxygen you get. Turn everything into chemistry, let's say. But he nonetheless rejected much Catholic rites as useless works righteousness, especially those rites that gave the impression of guaranteeing a predictable outcome. Pilgrimages, blessing of objects, the use of holy water, the veneration of the saints and their relics, the wearing of holy medals, for example. In the Reformed camp, superstition was much greater concern than the delusion of works righteousness, and the attack on Catholic piety was more severe. As Reformed Protestants saw it, the central miracle of the Catholic faith, transubstantiation, was no more than hocus-pocus, literally the mumbled hoc est corpus meum of Eucharist consecration transformed into a magical incantation, every bit as mystifying as the word abracadabra. In 1521, Luther regarded the power of rituals was surpassed by that of his colleague Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstad, who called for the abolition of images and much of Catholic ritual, including the Mass. Karlstad's extreme point of view was shared by the Swiss reformers, all of whom undertook a campaign against Catholic ritual as superstition and idolatry. Now notice how idolatry comes in in that sense as a cousin of superstition, and I think, again, it ought to be bundled in with magic. This gets really tricky because you have questions of authority in all of this, but, but I think, again, the, the thing to pay attention to is the, is the depersonalized cause and effect mechanism, which is at heart why, as Lewis points out again and again, magic and technology are basically the same thing. From Switzerland, this aggressive rejection of Catholic ritual was passed on to other churches in the Reformed tradition, including that of England. Eventually, in all places where the Protestantism took root and flourished, papistry, superstition, and idolatry became synonymous, and little tolerance would be shown towards anything that smacked of Catholicism. In response to Protestantism, the Catholic Church reaffirmed the absolute legitimacy of its rituals, and at the very same time, it initiated a campaign to fight superstition on two fronts— internally in regard to vital rituals, and externally in regard to practices it deemed unchristian. Now, what's going to happen now is a clampdown, which this is, a, I think, a great example of mimetic rivalry shaping the two, opponent, the two opposing rivals to become so much like each other. And, and so what, what, Roman, what the Catholic Church does in fighting Protestantism is it becomes, in some ways, more Protestant. And this is where the Orthodox Church is kind of interesting because they weren't formed by that process. Now, I know there's a good side to that in which a lot of this wildness of the, of the, of the pre-modern world is, is maintained, and so that's a blessing, but there's another way in which it also hasn't been tested the way that the Catholic Church was. So again, as with almost all things, there are upsides and downsides. Relying on scholastic theology, the Catholic Church took a more methodological approach to the issue of superstition, dividing into four different types. The improper worship of the true God, idolatry, divination, and vain observances, which included magic and occult arts. Such distinctions were incomprehensible to most of the laity and to some clergy too, but they mattered to those who were in charge of enforcing correctness. This is always an issue with hierarchy, that you've got people that sort of understand it completely, but there's sort of a there's sort of a there's sort of a watershed that comes down and people just pick it up in low resolution and sort of develop instincts within it. Such distinctions were incomprehensible. Uh, the fourth category of vain observances was the broadest and include the greatest number of people since it covered everything from the trivial, which it remedies for, such as remedies for hiccups, to the very worst, such as witchcraft. 
And this is the key that I highlighted when I read the book a while ago. The Council of Trent did not delve deeply into the problem of superstition, but it did issue, uh, but it did issue call on bishops. Again, a little typo, a call on bishops to prohibit and abolish all such things which have been introduced by irreverence, which can scarcely be separated from impiety or by superstition, um, that false imitation of true piety. Concerning the one area of Catholic piety where reformists had detected the most intense superstition, the directives of Trent were clear, but not very specific. In the invocation of saints, the veneration of relics, and the sacred use of images, ordered the council, every superstition shall be removed. In a similar vein, but with a more detailed instruction, Trent also demanded that all, all the superstitions, all the superstitious abuses that surrounded the Mass be done away with, that no place shall be given to superstition. They shall, by edict and under penalty, laid down that the priests take care not to celebrate at other than due hours, nor make use of other rites or other ceremonies and prayers in the celebration of the Masses, Besides those which have been approved by the church, they shall wholly remove from the church the observance of a number of certain masses and of candles as being invented rather by superstitious worship than by true worship. Okay, so even though obviously the, 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 the canvas is broader than the highly limiting element of the Protestant churches, you still sort of have this modern this modernist control mechanism that says, well, let's, let's, let's cut this stuff out. And, and in that way, you, you get a sense of the spirit of modernity coming into it. These reforms were quickly implemented in some places, such as Spain, with more gradually in others, such as Germany. But in the early 1600s, much of what had offended purists, such as Erasmus, was still in place. But the more blatant superstitions surrounded Catholic worship had, in many places, been greatly reduced. Much harder to combat, and even harder to exterminate, was the vast throng of ancient beings and spirits from local folklore who infested the landscape. Notice, infested the landscape. Fairies, gnomes, trolls, elves, pixies, sprites, gremlins, goblins, nymphs. I don't know who they are. Leprechauns, imps, and others of their ilk. Now, isn't it interesting that this is sort of the area in which, well, Tolkien, the Catholic, sort of, and Lewis, the Anglican, sort of brings these in, in another way. But have they now sort of been redeemed? Um, are they, have, has, have certain things, sort certain spirits sort of been wrung out of them? So now we can more safely imagine them and use their names? I don't know. These beings were the stuff of myth and of popular imagination. Some were spiritual, others physical. The Catholic Church had long taught that such beings were but demons, and Protestants took the same tack, so their existence was implicitly reaffirmed. Though demonized, and therefore subjected to the same treatment as all other things diabolical, these beings stubbornly clung to the collective imagination. Banishing them from folklore, art, and literature was even harder, as proven by William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, written in 1590s. As the war against superstition and the devil was beginning to peak, and by the works of Baroness... I don't know how to say, I don't know. Um, who, who not only wrote about fairies a century after Shakespeare, but also coined the term fairy tale in her book, um, Contest de Fe, 1697, if the war against the devil had been entirely successful, this genre of literature, which only, which only gained in popularity with the passage of time, would never have come into existence. And so, you know, I think this is, this is some of the Peugeotian, hey, hey, watch out in terms of taking the corners of the field. Because the more you try to get rid of these, the more problematic they may become. Whereas if you sort of leave them on the fringe, they might be okay. Ghosts were even harder to dispel. The interweaving of folk culture and religion was particularly tight on the subject of ghosts, principally because the Catholic Church's teaching on purgatory. That souls in purgatory could visit the living was an ancient belief sanctioned by the church and reinforced by it in a myriad of ways. 
from St. Gregory the Great's dialogues of the 6th century through many medieval texts and up to the eve of the Reformation, the appearance of souls from purgatory was a common theme in literature, sermons, and especially monastic piety. Most ghostly visits had a common purpose, to ask the living to do more for the soul in purgatory, or to inform the living that their suffrages had worked. But there were also accounts in modern and popular culture that veered from the straight and narrow. In these tales, ghosts appeared for all sorts of reasons, some of them profane, such as to request vengeance. The church taught that many ghostly apparitions were really demonic, and that it was very easy for the devil to fool one into thinking that one is seeing a ghost. Discerning whether an apparition was a genuine re revenant, a human visitor from the hereafter, or a demon, was tricky. But in most cases, the decision hinged on what the ghost spoke about or requested for. Normally, genuine ghosts should only deal with one subject, purgatory. Protestant rejection of purgatory closed off the option of visits from the suffering dead. Protestants believed that the dead went straight to heaven or hell, that there was no way that they could visit the living, and therefore all ghostly visits had to be demonic. Abundant evidence proved that Protestants nonetheless kept believing in ghostly apparitions, despite official denials of human revenants. This dissonance revealed that a gap was created between popular belief and high theology, and that the gap was difficult to bridge. The theologians maintained a firm position. No matter how many ghosts were reported by the laity, as they saw it, all ghosts were demons and had to be treated as such. Now, I think what we're beginning to see here, again, by the 20th and 21st century, you have basically a class distinction between the, that revolves around these kinds of things. One of the things that I've noted regularly, I don't link it because the Veritas Forum really likes to police use of their videos, is a Veritas Forum clip from Dallas Willard, where Dallas Willard, who taught at USC, is walking on campus with someone else, and he just notes that it's basically the spirit of the campus that sort of retards belief in God. Um, the spirit of the camp. oh, you believe in miracles? This is, this is sort of belief by um, reduction of social status. You lose status if you say things like you believe in miracles. Now, I think this is starting to fade, and I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things on these realms because of this fading, but you can see it beginning already. The high theologian says, ghosts are demons. Among the people, they're like, yeah, they're not really. And so, of course... You have a status differential, and you're going to have people operating, people in lower lower socioeconomic, socioeconomics, not just economics, it's lower status, are going to keep this amongst themselves. And this is why I often talk about the fact that people tell their pastors all kinds of things in private that they won't tell them in public because the pastor is not supposed to talk. The most authoritative and influential pot Protestant treatise on this subject was written by Ludwig um, Lavatur, 1527 to 1586, a theologian from Zurich and the son-in-law of Henrik Bollinger. Lavatur's On Spectres, Apparitions, and Great and Unaccustomed Noises, first published in German in 1569 and Latin in 1570, was translated into various languages and published repeatedly. Lavatur's position was but a reiteration of what had already been taught among Protestants since the 1520s. All ghostly apparitions were demonic. But he addressed the subject with such clarity and such thoroughness that his text was, was definitive. Such teachings were not necessarily accepted at the popular level. However, and the survival of medieval ghost beliefs show up in the record of those in charge of social discipline and in literature. The ghost of Hamlet's father and that of Banquio in Macbeth are both, are both ambitious figures who could be perceived as human revenants or as demons' sole intent to stir up trouble. Shakespeare's Protestant audience would have understood the brilliant ambiguity of these characters for living as they did in a world, of tran in, a world in transition. They were all too familiar with equivocation and ghostly traces in Catholicism. Magic. Beyond the vain observances and mundane superstitions that Catholics tried to eliminate and beyond the Protestant attack on Catholic idolatry and superstition, reformers of both traditions aimed to eradicate the worst source of commerce with the devil, that of magical arts. 
Unlike superstition, magic was not mired in ignorance or passivity. It required some skill and knowledge and expertise involved in rites other than those sanctioned by the Catholic Church. Now you see sort of magic bleeding into spiritual technology, let's call it. At this level, the devil became much more actively involved, even if no evil doing was involved. No explicit pacts were made with him, and no one was aware of the presence or participation. Though the line between magic and witchcraft could be blurry at times, distinctions were made were nevertheless made by experts in a certain range of practices that did not necessarily involve explicit pacts with demons or the inflicting of harm on others came to be identified as magic. This magic intended to fall to two categories, divination, the manufacture and use of special substances. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to go here and there's a very interesting conversation that Preston Spinkle had on his channel around Josh Butler's book. Now, those of you in the Protestant world know that Josh Butler wrote a book that was in the, an excerpt was found on the Gospel Coalition that had some, uh, maybe we could just pull it up. Baptist Global News weighs in with the clickbait title. You don't need more context to understand Josh Butler's article on sex and the church. Analysis by Rick Pid Pidcock. Is that really the name that you wanted to have for your analysis of Josh Butler's graphic, uh, graphic Christian book? In the wake of the Gospel Coalition publishing a male-centric sexual fantasy about Christ penetrating the church, we are getting a clearer picture of how their alliance is characterized by carelessness and control in an attempt to build an, uh, author platforms by cultivating and protecting their image. Now, I would very much imagine that with the passing of Tim Keller, the Gospel of Coalition is very much looking to uh, develop the farm team of young theologians to replace uh, the aging luminaries like Keller and Piper. In their founding documents, the Gospel Coalition, we often um, we often see the celebration of our union with Christ replaced. Uh, well, let's skip a little bit here. Butler's controversial article. It was removed less than 24 hours after it was posted was an adaptive excerpt from his forthcoming book, Beautiful Union. Readers who found or shared the link or excerpts were indeed, were instead greeted Thursday night with a message from Kim who thanked readers for their feedback and patience as the Gospel Coalition considered how to respond. This isn't the first time the Gospel Coalition has uh, um, has used the Gospel to sacralize male sexual hierarchy over women. They published an article where Jared Wilson quoted Douglas Wilson saying, the sexual act cannot be made into an egalitarian pleasure party. A man penetrates, conquers, colonizes, plants. A woman receives, surrenders, accepts. This is, of course, offensive to all egalitarians, and so um, our culture was rebelled against the concept of authority and submission in marriage. Uh, the late Rachel Held Evans responded at the time, what is perhaps most disconcerting is the fact that even after multiple women expressed their concern in the comment section, both Jared Wilson and Doug Wilson repeatedly dismissed these concerns with exasperation and condescension, ridiculing the commenter's lack of reading comprehension. So this, this is obviously a big, um, there, there's a lot of elements to this particular food fight. Now, Preston Sprinkle, of course, has, has basically made a career of dealing with um, evangelical uh, theology of sex, and so he put this group together, and this was a very interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot from it. I had read Josh Butler's previous book. I don't know how many books he's written. Here's his book, Skeletons in God's Closet. Now, Butler is an interesting guy. It comes out on this is. His wife is egalitarian, but he's sort of a soft complementarian, and you know that sorts of puts him in the in the gospel coalition, uh, in the gospel coalition fold. And, and Butler's an interesting writer because, on one hand, he's 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 very much sort of in the Keller sphere in that he's winsome, and he tends to write in a way that doesn't trigger most 
sort of progressive evangelicals. And the idea is that this is a guy who can maybe bring some of these people who are deconstructing and let's say wandering towards the main line. He can, he can settle them down and say, no, we, uh, we conservatives really aren't so bad. So in this group, um, Preston got together uh, Dr. Sandy Richter, who I didn't know anything about, but she, 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 she was very interesting to watch in this. Uh, she was quite persuasive on a number of points. She, she clearly knows her stuff about ancient Near East uh, culture and theology. And so watching her and Josh Butler sort of compare notes, it's very interesting. Part of what's interesting is, again, many sort of in this little corner who read the Butler thing, now with a lot more experience to orthodoxy, are sort of like, oh, well, that, that, that metaphor doesn't really scare us. Others will probably react more like Sandy Richter and like others. Now, what's really interesting is that Brenna Blaine, who is sort of the is the woman with the tattoo on her neck, who is you know probably someone who we would expect to be sort of really drifting left. She loved the book. She defends him on everything. She's like, I wanted to hate this book. I, I, I started reading this book ready to condemn it, but as I saw how he talked, I really enjoyed it. And that didn't surprise me given uh, what I had read um, and Skeletons in God's Closet. Um, you know, I reached out to Richard Beck. I'm sort of tempted to reach out to Josh Butler and, um, and just do a, do a conversation with him. Not necessarily, again, a book conversation, but he's an... He's a, he, He's interesting. He he resigned from his church over this in order to devote more time to the book. And I thought, well, there's got to be a story in there. But let's let's jump into let's jump into Sandy Richter. We should probably look up Sandy Richter and get a little bit more bio on her. Now, Bethel McGrew probably knows who these people are better than I do. She tends to pay more attention to who's who. She's she's clearly an Old Testament prof. Uh, she teaches at Westmont College, so I, I would imagine. She's probably sort of moderate, evangelical, um, egalitarian. I don't know if she's um, creeping towards more uh, progressive evangelicalism. I don't know. So let's let's hear some of what she has to say here, because I, I found this whole thing very interesting. Um, but big picture issues here. Um, and I, one of my biggest questions is um, this business about trying to sacramentalize the sex act. Um, okay, this is where, when we look at where a lot of evangelism is going, it's the, I, I'll often talk about this, this movement as sort of neo-sacramental. So we've got Protestants who are like, well, there's two sacraments, but there's other things that are sort of sacramental-ish. And, and marriage is usually sort of the first on that list. And, and again, I see this, part of the why I started out with um, Erie is in terms of broad movements of time and broad spiritual migration, this tends to be the question and the flow. So, so the Catholics, okay, we're going to nail down seven sacraments. Nice number. Um, Protestants are going to nail down two sacraments found in scripture. Limit that canon. Let's let's really get a rein on the superstition and the magic. And now in sort of a re-enchanting broad movement, which is clearly where a lot of the evangelism is coming, well, hmm, concerns well up. Um, I totally agree with you that the Protestant church desperately needs a healthy theology of sex. Definitely agree with you there. And I think there's a lot of good work that maybe hasn't hit the mainstream, um, certainly that that I've been reading because I'm an undergraduate prof and it's all they think about. Um, so obviously, um, I, you know, I'm engaged, but for, um, for Protestants uh, to be attempting to turn the Marriage Sex Act into a sacrament, I mean, that's part of what the Reformation was about. And our response to the Catholic Church our response, obviously I wasn't there, um, what involved issues that included the fact that not all humanity will have the opportunity to be a part of the sex act and a sacrament. Uh, this is very interesting. 
should be available to every believer. A I thought that was a very strong argument. Sacrament should be an expression of um, what I would, you know, what I would call some sort of provenient grace, uh, mm. some sort of opportunity for sanctification. And this, of course, is why the Protestant Church uh, dialed back the Catholic Church to only baptism and communion. So that's going to be a big question of mine, this sacramentalization. But yeah. then the other perspective that I want to introduce into this conversation is that of, of a scholar of the ancient Near East. Mm. And I don't think Genesis 2 is talking about the sex act. It's talking about fictive kinship. Mm. And it's talking about the incarnation. It's not talking about a penis and a vagina. <laughs> um, and in its expression of the uh, fictive kinship, to quote the master of these things, Frank Moore Cross, flesh refers not to... Now, I thought this was a strong argument too, but I actually think a little bit later, Josh Butler wins that argument carnal union, but to identity of flesh, kinship, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Obviously, offspring of the marital union will be of one flesh. But what is asserted is that the covenant of marriage establishes kinship bonds of the first rank between spouses. So when Jesus talks about marriage with the church, he's talking about joining our flesh, bone of our bones. Um, which is huge, obviously, um, and the idea that he has entered into the human experience. So that's going to be one of my ancient Near Eastern perspectives. And the other one... It's interesting that she said human experience and didn't say human flesh. Is that the idea of sacred marriage is as old as the hills. And it goes back to the Akitu festival in ancient Mesopotamia, when the king would, uh, in the public eye, go into the tent of the high priestess, have sex with her in public to reinvigorate the land. Mm -hmm. And it's based on fertility cults and, and pagan religions. It's what, what Baal is all about. And in many ways, it's what Yahweh is attempting to deliver the people of God from not introduce them to okay now you see what well, part of why i really enjoyed dominion is tom holland didn't start in the reformation tom holland didn't even start with augustine tom holland started with the hebrew prophets and and i think tom holland is right because basically you have this spiritual opponent processing that's that's very much all the way back to israel and to and to the bible that there's a there there's in, in terms of runaway there's the stop to paganism but the the, the the question is always well well how how much and it's like if you go one way you wind up with gnosticism if you go the other way you wind up with nature religion and 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 the goal is to sort of keep it there in tension to to get the right understanding and last point in there that's why I think that all the bodily functions of nocturnal emissions and menstruation and post-delivery fluids don't belong in the temple because all of those fluids and activities were a part of the magic of the Egyptian cult, the Canaanite cult, the Mesopotamian. There's the word, magic. And cult. And, and I think we, you know, to not be pejorative, we would say spiritual technology. And I think the message of Leviticus is um, is is clearly uh, communicating that stuff is all great and it all belongs outside the sacred precinct because it's what regular folk do as a regular expression of their lives. It has nothing to do with worshiping me. Yeah. So so interesting That's those great. are the views that i'm wondering why they didn't get into all of those critiques great. i just want to say I, I picked such a great dialogue partner for this conversation thank yes. you Andy. <laughs> josh That's is like oh. well, well done preston well done oh crap i don't know what's getting into <laughs> no those are great questions so uh maybe i'll address um in a little bit of a different order so i think i'll start with 
much, you know, so the one flesh, is it referring to conjugal union or kinship? And I think that's a great mm -hmm. question. You know, I, so a couple observations there first would just be that historically, uh, the main understanding has been conjugal union it's, it's still today in the Catholic Orthodox. Others would see one flesh as conjugal union language. Um, and what I argue in chapter three is that some of the modern. Okay, sorry, Josh, can I just ask a clarifying when you say historically, obviously the Catholic church kind of had, you know, um, a monopoly on theology for, I don't know, 1600 years. So um, when you I, I think there's a few Orthodox around that would beg to differ. Say historically, do you mean this is a Catholic Orthodox position? Uh Yes, at least my, my understanding today from is that this is a this is not a fringe perspective that I hold, but it's actually a broad global Christian perspective. It's not the only perspective, but it's it's a it's it's not a fringe perspective to see one flesh is referring to conjugal union. Uh, so in chapter three, um, what I attempt to sh show there is I think one of the um, mistakes that's been made is that often one flesh and bone and flesh are being conflated, that they're actually two distinct terms. And so um, for those who would see one flesh is just more fictive kinship language, like James Brownson, I know has been influential in a lot of circles of this argument. In, uh, now, now Brownson is a Reformed Church of America um, professor at Western Seminary, I believe in Holland, Michigan, and his daughter um, was an early same-sex clergy in the eastern part of the Reformed Church of America. So he, he wrote this book to uh, justify same-sex marriage. So that's that, that's part of the reason they can say Brownson in this room. And the assumption is that probably all four of them would very much know who he is and sort of where he stands on things. And th of course, the the same-sex marriage conversation is sort of you know lurking behind this whole conversation. Yeah, in, in some of his work and other, like, but I argue, I think that that's actually conflating two distinct terms, that one flesh as a term is never used for kinship. It's a different phrase, bone and flesh, and um, kinship, the broader kinship ties are always the term flesh and bone, or bone and flesh. Uh, so I think of, like, when Uncle Laban sees his nephew Jacob and is like, you're you're my own bone and flesh, and uh, Abimelech, he asks his relatives at one point to make him king, and uh, he's like, remember, you're my bone and flesh. Or David tells his tribesmen of Judah, you know, like the elders of Judah, like, you're my bone and flesh. Um, he doesn't say, let's become one flesh. He says, you're my bone and flesh. And he's referring to their kind of family ties of kinship and kind of like similar to how we would refer to kids today as our flesh and bone. You know, they bear some of our nature and substance they've originated from us. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, my, my concern would be that the actual term one flesh is only an ever used for conjugal union. And it seems as well like, Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 um, refers to, you know, sex, someone having sex with a prostitute as one flesh. And he quotes just the part about the two becoming one flesh from Genesis. And he doesn't have in mind there, I think, ties of uh, kinship and all. And so all this, I think there's a strong argument and a broad tradition that would see one flesh as conjugal union uh, rather than kinship. And the way that I try and put it in the book is that the two terms are related. Uh, one flesh generates flesh and bone, you know? So uh, the reason that Uncle Laban and his nephew Jacob are, you know, are share flesh and bone is drum roll please, blah, 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 you know, because their grandparents got it off. My dad sex, like, you know, their ancestors, David's ancestors had one flesh and had sex. And that's why they share, uh, you know, flesh and bone as, as a tribe, so to speak. So that's, yeah, that we want to in there. I think on the second one with the temple, uh, part of the burden of the third section of the book is to show how interwoven temple symbolism is with uh, sexual symbolism. And so um, in the Old Testament, uh, there's a lot here, you know, but the temple uh, had a lot of associations with the female body, like a new Eve. Uh, as a corporate representative for Israel as the bride of Yahweh and the most holy place having associations with uh, the womb and Yahweh's union uh, with his bride, you know, with his bridal temple, like uh, his indwelling presence led to fruitfulness in the land, kind of an abundant fertility, the streams of living water going forward. And, um, and so I, I think this becomes clearest in Song of Solomon, where I essentially I try and argue in the book that there are three almost like Russian nesting dolls. You can go to those dolls where there's like the little one and then the bigger version and the bigger version. And so I argue that those three Russian nesting dolls, like the little version is marriage, uh, the bigger version is the temple, 
and the bigger version is God and his people, and that all three of those are kind of... Now, now part of what's so interesting about this is that right now, there's, there's a lot of pieces moving in different directions, because the in in protestant history so monasticism and, and i'm working out of time to talk with sam and laura about let's say a um a priority of chastity in uh patristic christianity and and sort of it's definitely not sex positive let's say in, in the sense that they are today and so protestantism sort of says okay so you have the little church and the little church is the home. And, and so there's, there's a lot of cross pressures going back and forth here between the traditions. Um, obviously, the, the older traditions much more comfortable with the symbolism, but, but that later that makes people, that makes people nervous, as, as I read in the Baptist piece. Kind of mutually illuminating. And so a lot of the marriage and sexual symbolism at work in the temple um, it's drawing on language and imagery and stuff from marriage in, in the Bible. And all of it's being used to point to the bigger picture of God's relationship with his people. Uh, so I, that'd be my thoughts on the, the temple symbolism is like, it, it seems to me very clear biblically. And that's part of the burden of the book is to show that that temple symbolism um, works in that way. Uh, the third and Final. Uh, really Sandy, to say. do you want to jump in real quick? And yeah, I'm just, uh, Preston. I'm basically wondering how you want to do this. Like, yeah. um, do we do we want to take each one of those points and and respond and critique, or or do we want to do the 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 blanket thing? Um, yeah, I started let, with the blanket thing. Yeah. Let's. Um, well, let's. Okay. Let's. You have, a th you have a third point, Josh. Let's maybe have you finish that, and then Sandy, whatever. If you want to take a couple individual ones and respond, I think that'd be. That'd be great. I, I can I, I do want to point out I don't I don't think the the these are two these are related, the theological point Josh was making, but also the language he was using to present that. And I do want to at least acknowledge for people listening that I think if if we're dealing with the finer points of kind of a more Catholic view of sex and marriage versus a more Protestant view, I don't think that would have produced the outrage. I think it was more <laughs> the appearance of male domination in the sex act and so some of the you know so so in other words uh, i i think that there are multiple reasons why they got the outrage one was a cultural presumption that churches stay rated g and something that's so i think that was that element one was just sort of the the graphic nature of the imagery another was definitely um this egalitarian pressure within Protestantism, and then the feminist concern about this, which is what was in that Baptist article. So I, I just want to at least acknowledge we will get to that in a little bit, but I think it is important to to at least expose some of the theological intricacies where there's you know some some rub here. So well, and, and yeah, yeah, and for me, I mean, the the theological issues are important. Um, I'm not a Catholic, and I'm not a Catholic for specific and informed reasons um and neither is the gospel coalition which is so intriguing to me why in the world would they be championing catholic theology but what i'm more interested in is see and and right there they're not championing catholic theology this the the neo-sacramentalism is what's moving and the young restless and reform movement which is part of the emergent movement this is bleeding edge you know people went from tim keller to jordan peterson to jonathan peugeot and so these um these new sensibilities and new um desire and at least uh, interest in some of these symbolic relationships are part of what's going on here. In my opinion, the errors that have produced these viewpoints. Um, for any of us to argue against Frank Moore Cross when it comes to fictive kinship is, uh, we're way out of our league. Um, he, uh, you know, this is uh, his lifetime career and it's not flesh and bone. Um, I think the phrase you're after, Josh, is flesh. That, that, that's a pretty heavy expert card she just played. Blood. Um, so the idea of being one flesh 
is a standard expression of tribal traditional societies. And the idea is that one flesh is reproduced throughout the tribe and one blood flows in the veins of all the tribe. And that's why there's blood vengeance and that's why we care for each other. And that's why all of these laws of defending see and then if you bring that more into this internet space well now sort of you've got well isn't isn't that sort of you know all this talk about evolutionary psychology so so what what's happening now is that you're having things that tended to sort of flow in one direction are now all over the map our own flesh um I, I, I totally agree with you that there are a lot of people out there that would say um, they'll become one flesh is is uh, simply the sex act. Uh, but that one flesh shows up and that phrase flesh and blood shows up all over the Old Testament as not only an expression of blood kinship, but a fictive kinship. And of course, marriage is fictive kinship and adoption is fictive kinship. Um, yeah. Can you, can you so explain what you, what I, you mean by fictive kinship just yeah, for our audience? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So a traditional society is a tribal society. And for most of your listeners, Preston, they really have no idea what a tribal society is, right? And so I will often say to my students, you know, think about um, – think about the indigenous americans um think about the sioux the cherokee the chumash um think about what you see on the news in the middle east and and how folks seem to be outrageously loyal simply based on um relationship that's that's tribal compared to us and it's the idea that I have responsibility to all of my ancestors before me and all of the ancestors that I will produce based simply on the fact that we share the same genetic code. So now we step into a space where as a society we need to give responsibilities and privileges to people who aren't part of our genetic code. So you look at a Ruth and Boaz, you look at um, Shechem and Jacob and his sons. What are we going to do about this? Well, we're going to create fictive kinship. So we're going to name each other relatives so that the responsibilities and privileges of being relatives will move into our world. And we do that primarily through covenant. Uh, for those who've read my work, you can covenant at every strata of society to extend those privileges and responsibility to someone who actually isn't your flesh and blood. That's fictive kinship. Mm -hmm. And in our world, the most visible forms of fictive kinship, even in our bureaucratic society, is marriage. Because once I marry, um, I in the eyes of the state, uh, we are a unit, right? And adoption is another perfect example, because if I adopt a child, I have the exact same responsibilities to that child as if I had birthed that child. I have to feed it, protect it, educate it, etc. But those are fictional kinship bonds. And Genesis 2, um, it, I mean, obviously it is man and woman, there is going to be a conjugal act. But uh, I think fictive, and I only think it because I was taught it. So, so now again, because of the same-sex marriage controversy back there, you can just feel its gravitational pressure on people's either attraction or re repulsion from these arguments. It's very interesting how lots of different um, gravitational bodies in, let's say, a a solar system around theological debate will put pressure on on different elements that might not have been there in previous generations by the folks who are the experts in the field that this is an expression of fictive kinship um and uh, so that's one issue and then josh you were just getting into the temple issue um so maybe let you go back to that Sure. No, that's great. Okay. On the, thank you, Sandy. Um, yeah. So on the fictive kinship, the concern I would have is, well, you mentioned, you know, part of my backdrop um, back in the day was, you know, my, was living with and working among indigenous peoples globally. Mm. So my college and post-college was a uh, focus of my thesis and master, you know, my focus, my work was on the impact of globalization on indigenous peoples. And mm. so living internationally, and one of the things that really struck me was 
how tighter the sense of family bonds, like family, even over friendships, even over things. And I think the very natural ingrained sense that I, you know, I always picked up on was um, we share flesh and bone, you know, like we are flesh and blood, you know, I think Hebrew uses the bone and flesh phrase and uh, we often use the blood and flesh phrase, but uh, flesh and blood, but there's something that's pointing to going, we actually share uh, a, a family substance, so to speak, that's come about through these family bonds. But I also think that um, it was very clear, like that's because we share a common ancestral lineage rooted in sexual union. Like our ancestors had sexual union and that's how we came into the world. It was kind of the underlying uh, idea or backdrop. And the question I would have is, you know, you mentioned that all over the place, one flesh is used to describe um, fictive kinship rather than some wife. And well, well, it I, describes right, both. Is it, the phrase, yeah. is it the phrase one flesh? Because I, I my, my sense, unless I've just been missing it, like the phrase one flesh is never used to describe something other than the male female pair bond. But um, the, or, or are you saying the concept is there if it's read through the, the, yeah. the concept of sharing flesh? And I didn't have, um, and I apologize for this, I haven't read the whole manuscript. So I, I didn't come prepared with a word study. I'm actually doing it real quick while you're talking. Um, so um, the- I can, I, I, I've done this search. So echad baser, is that the phrase? One mm -hmm. flesh is only used, is I think five or six times in scripture. It's always either in, well, Genesis 2, 24, but then also when Genesis 2, 24 is quoted, it's never used um, outside of describing the uh, male female marriage bond. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, but we. Is that what you're? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't want to jump in, but is that? No, no, that's yeah. no, that's really helpful. So the phrase um, "flesh, flesh," like, yeah, and course, flesh and flesh. blood, yeah. flesh. flesh and blood, yeah. flesh, yeah, is used is used so, repeatedly. Yeah. Um, and I, and I don't want to undermine the fact that marriage as alliance is a critical part of any traditional society. Um, absolutely. In fact, you know, when you get to uh, the judgment phrases in the book of Judges, what did they do wrong? They gave their daughters in marriage and they received um, uh, the Canaanites' daughters in marriage because what they're doing is they're um, expanding the people of God through that very standard um, means by which a tribe is formed. They're offering marriage to people who are outside the covenant. And, and of course, that always gets moved forward into the New Testament wrong, but, um, you know, so, and maybe, honestly, I, I don't think this is the core of our conversation, and I also don't think we're going to agree. Um, so uh, maybe we should move on to the temple thing. I'm, I'm going to stick with cross, um, <laughs> and anyone out there of the Harvard School is going to say, down with Josh. Um, <laughs> I'll stick with Gumball in a second. <laughs> Yeah. I, can I, I, yeah. Could it, could it, does it have to be an either or? I'm, I'm just thinking if, if it's true that one flesh is describing specifically the male female um, bond in marriage, um, we can, I think we would all agree that only, pe only sexual different pairings can form an actual one flesh union. Because this is James Brownson's argument. He takes, uh, Frank Moore Cross, I think in a direction that Frank Moore Cross wouldn't actually have agreed with, but he says, yeah, this is the, this is a new kinship bond and sex difference is not required to form a one flesh union. Um, and that's where I'm like, well, well, no, it, it, in, it, you know, scripturally, whenever we see one flesh, it does specify a, a sex difference coming together in, in a new kinship bond. Sure. Um, so I do think sex difference is necessary for the one flesh union. Now where Josh, where I, I might disagree with Josh, I think maybe he pushes the particulars of those sexual differences maybe a bit too far, or at least are exploring, you know, theological themes mapped on specific sex differences as in our anatomy, you know, and I know other scholars have done that. Um, so I don't, as I'm hearing you speak, I'm, I'm thinking I, I, I kind of lean more towards Sandy and in, in not making it so particular. And yeah, I still want to preserve sex difference as part of the one flesh union. But then if we say, well, what constitutes sex difference? Most of our sexual differences between male and female have to do with how good God designed us for reproduction, right? So it's not, to me, it's not, it's not um, 
unheard of that Josh would kind of go down that lane and explore some of the more, more particulars of that. Mm -hmm. I just think I'm a little more cautious with when I read Ephesians 5, like thinking that Paul is getting into those real particular aspects of sex differences coming together in a conjugal union. Is that, is that making sense? And, and again, I'm, yeah. I'm trying hard to, no, I want you guys yeah. to work out some of the. No, no, that makes sense. And, and again, uh, this is not, I believe this, and I, I think it's correct, but it, it's not it's not a hill I'm going to die on. Um, but I, I want to get to the temple stuff, really. The particulars of magical stuff and magical acts that mimic the magical acts of the gods and that somehow regenerate. And I feel like I'm reading Inanna de Muzi. I feel like I'm reading... Uh, and, and this, you know, of course, is my particular perspective. Most of your audience doesn't even know who Nana is. Um, and I I fear that what your book is doing is pulling back in a lot of those ancient practices that, and, and I would say Catholicism does this as well. Again, there are reasons I'm not a Catholic, mm. uh, where transubstantiation becomes magic the actual host has power. It has been transformed into some sort of primordial sacred stuff that if you put it on your, if you allow a priest to place it on your tongue, it will somehow magically transform you. That's pagan. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll defer to you theologians. Thank um, you. Well, yeah, yeah just a couple of quick thoughts. First on the Song of Solomon. Th there, there you see the anxiety. There you see the anxiety. and. And, and this this anxiety, again, this is sort of this opponent processing with respect to agency. Is it is it sort of a, a mechanistic, modern, tight correlation? Is it a personal relationship where there's, there's both strength and looseness? There's variability. Or is it is it technology? Now, this poor woman in the lower right-hand corner, she didn't get to talk much through this whole thing, but she, she really liked the book and, and her, her contribution was interesting too. Very much watch the whole video. Um, I probably don't want to use any more of this in this video. I wanted to make this point. And then I want to go to Peugeot and Richard Rowland because this section about, uh, about patron saints is really important because again, what Jonathan notes is that there's a, they're sort of in this a caution against a mechanistic hierarchy um, where there's there is a hierarchy but it's not sort of laid in in terms of rigid cause and effect um, quid pro quo relationships uh, a good example would be like your local patron saint right uh, holy people sort of exist outside or kind of bridge the hierarchy in unexpected ways so if you live in a small medieval village in Central Europe or something like this, you know, you've got the emperor and the patriarch and everything way up here, way up above you. But then like, there's also your local patron saint, maybe it's St. Nicholas, right? So like, if things are, if things are really getting out of hand, so you, you have, a, uh, you have a, a, a path of like appeal, let's say, right? You can, you can go to- and, and what's interesting about this, okay, if things are really getting out of hand, like what like the hierarchy is getting too tyrannical part of the fascinating thing about the exodus seminar and i've now listened to the whole thing and i want to listen to some of these later episodes a second or a third time is is it, it's very much a sen a question of sensibilities i've been listening to some of the meta modern stuff on youtube and so you have modern which is sort of this that uh, you have deism, it's mechanize everything. And, and what's ironic is that within this mechanize everything, there you have this anxiety and this concern within theology not to mechanize everything. Okay, well, why not? Well, there's, there's sort of two rivals, and one of them is, is sort of the, um, the loose, and the other, and they're not disconnected, the other is the personal, and to not mechanize persons. To St. Nicholas... And he can go around, I mean, you know, he can go around the the Pope or the Patriarch or the or the Emperor or whatever and to kind of like help you out in your situation. So you've got holy people and of course the prob the problem with um the problem with modern people trying to understand this is we all want to be the person who's outside the hierarchy, right? And it doesn't there.
because modern people lack sort of the proportionality because modern people use sort of this modern imagination to navigate the frame you know but it's but it's really just the holy people and when i say holy really hear that not just in a sense of this is a good person or a nice person but that in the sense that this person is sanctified or set apart because there are and and that's sanctified or set apart again because for canonization let's say in the roman catholic church it requires a miracle what does that in terms of a a in an economy of persons that asserts a relationship now of course if you read the new testament there's tons of relational stuff in there you know jesus calls his disciples you are now my friends oh, okay well that that meant something in the roman empire there's also such a sort of a thing as let's say uh like uh the secular holy person which i'll come back to in a minute mm -hmm. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, secular in the holy person, in the sense that somebody's like a secular, but they're but they're set apart, and because they're set apart, they they're also sort of operating outside the normal hierarchy of things. Yeah. So it's, it's in some ways there there are ways in which the hierarchies these are. How can I say that? Like in terms of a, and 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 the question here is okay, are these relationships corruption? Because for example, when I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, check that off on your bingo card. The, the the one we're going to start a little income generation project in a little poor community and we're going to do this and very quickly the pastor steps up and says well i'm very my wife should be the i would say oh women are going to run the store because because sometimes you know if if women have money the kids get fed if men have money the kids don't get fed not as much in evangelical communities but um but my my wife should be the one doing it and all of my relatives should work in the store we North Americans take a step back and say, mm, conflict of interest. That's, uh, that's violating something. These things should be impersonal. And they would say, no, they, they have to be personal. And so you feel the tensions between, but yeah, it's still the same in politics today. It's not what you know, but who you know. The system, it, it's like fail safes in the hierarchy. Hierarchy of things. Yeah. So. It's, it's in some ways, there, there are ways in which the hierarchies, these are... Can I say that, like, in terms of a system, it's it's like fail safes in the hierarchy. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's the way, way to. I mean, it's not it's not as simple as that, but it's yeah. a good way for people to understand why the hierarchies are never even even when we talk about hierarchy, they're never just this simple top down thing. They have yeah. a a kind of variability and and ways to to shortcut when things go wrong along the along the hierarchy itself. Actually, so um, before we started talking about before we started the recording we were talking about the arthurian stories a little bit and uh the like but the the knight errant is a good example of yeah. that kind of a person in, in in that sort of story right because they they have this role that puts them outside the normal hierarchy so they show up in like a baron's district and the baron is evil and he's awful and he's oppressing people and it's like well where's the king why doesn't the king know about what's going on but but actually the knight errant he has like a he has a pipeline to the king, right? So he's here from the round table. He's here from the king's court and he sets things right. And then he goes back, mm. right? He goes back yeah. to the court when it's over. So, and you have that all the time in contemporary storytelling. It's the reporter who sends things out to be broadcast throughout. So everyone can know about it. So you have to find a reporter. I watched a uh, night, was it night agent or something? It was a new, it was a new show on Netflix and it was about this guy who answered the phone and there were spies and you know it was sort of a sort of one of those stories but of course you've got to get the story out to the reporters because once everyone knows then the powerful people and you know someone's in the white house and they're going to bring down the president and the vice president and the chief of staff are in cahoots and they're corrupt and so there so it could be a reporter uh, an independent cop um, in fact, our stories are full of these kinds of people that do not fit into the hierarchy because the assumption is that there is corruption in the hierarchy. And so someone either has to do something that is not permitted by the rules or not in the hierarchy. You know, even though we are, we are a very modern sort of locked in system, our, our stories are just love the exceptions of the knight errants that will have the personal relationship and all of this sort of moves against these the anxiety for these locked in systems so and and you see these these movements um you see these movements developing over over long periods of time I go back to reformations um 
I picked up the golden key. Well, uh, I'll be playing. I'll be playing Jess and Sherry's excellent video on the channel. Their response to the Peugeot uh, Verveke conversation using the Book of Job. Of course, I thought it was just a terrific video. So, but but all of these anxieties. I mean, here hundreds of years, centuries later, we're still as a body working through these tensions okay well well you need the symbolism and you need the symbolism to gain traction and for people to sort of buy into it and connect to it but if you're if 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 you know the symbolism can get corrupt the hierarchies can get corrupt if you just have sort of this mechanistic system you know that can fail us too you know that you just have a locked into a mechanistic system you're going to be you're going to be falling prey to nihilism and a meaning crisis so um, I just thought, just watching these things sort of get put together. So, yeah, check out um, Preston's conversation. There's lots more good stuff in there. And I am by no means done with this particular video on nationalism because there there was just so much good stuff in this video. So we, I've got, I've got a whole list of things in my head. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about that, especially um, the not from human hands section in this video because it's really outstanding. So leave a comment. Let me know what you think.